So we are in our fourth sermon series on being built strong as a church and being built strong as individual Christians. And we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 today. So if you have your Bibles, uh, you want to go ahead and turn to there. I don't know about you, but going out to eat is one of my favorite things to do. And uh, yes, that's right. And going out to eat is fun. Uh, I don't really do a whole lot of other things. I mean, I like to fish. I like to play games. You know, there are certain things that I like to do. But as far as hobbies are concerned, eating is kind of like one of my hobbies. And, uh, yeah. and so going out to eat is, is, is a great time. Angel and I, it's something that we love to share in. We used to go out to eat all the time, even if it was just as simple as going to Panera Bread uh, and getting a drink and just playing a board game. In fact, one time we went to Panera Bread so often that the manager came over and said, whoever wins this game gets a free drink on me. And, of course, <clears throat> I don't want to brag or anything, but I won. But sometimes, you know, I'll text Angel, you know, we'll decide to go out to eat, and Angel is a people pleaser. She wants me to be happy. And so even if there's something that she's craving or she really wants, she'll just want the option to be left up to me. And so I'll say, hey, honey, you know, where, and literally, this actually happened, hey, honey, where do you want to go out to eat? And she said, I don't know, you choose. And if you know anything about me, eating is a hobby. And so I can eat pretty much anything. I don't really like things that are raw unless it's sushi. But, but, you know, I can pretty much eat anything. I'm like a tank. And so I'm like, no, you decide. You know, I'll be good with wherever you want to go. And she'll text me back and say, no, I really, you know, want you to decide. And we will go back and forth for like 12 text messages deciding what we're going to do. And finally, I'll just send her this picture from the notebook. It's, what do you want? Just tell me what you want to eat, and we will go there, Right? And so sometimes, you know, people do crave different things. People like different things. And deciding on something as easy as going out to eat, right? There's often a lot of division in that. Some people like Italian, and other people like American, and it, it can really vary. Well, it's the same thing in the church. The church has this, this issue, and it's plagued throughout Scripture about agreeing not on what to eat, but on agreeing on how to live. It's this word unity. And if the church is going to be built strong, if the church is going to be a church that is, has the integrity of a strong tree, unity is one of the most important aspects of a church. Time and time again throughout the New Testament, we find Paul warning against division, warning against schisms, warning against people deciding over different ways and how to live. And so that's why we have the word of God, is that, that we can be united on this. We can be together on this. And so this morning we're going to talk about unity. There is a misconception though about unity. And the first thing is is that everyone will agree on everything. We don't always agree, Angel and I, on where to eat or things for the house or maybe even how to raise Piper. We have different backgrounds, different ideas, um, different preferences. There's also another misconception that unity is is something that is uniform. That means everything looks the same. Everyone is the same. And often, that's not the case. I mean, just look around you in this room. You see people of different origins, different nationalities, different skin tones, with different backgrounds, with different education levels, with different preferences. I mean, the church is a literal melting pot. When you look at the kingdom of God worldwide and you see the church in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in America, in Canada, all over the world, people that sing differently, live differently, think differently, but yet in the eyes of God, we are one. We are like one body. And so while we may not agree on everything and while we may not all be the same thing, we are called to be unified. But what does that mean? What, is, what does unity actually look like? Well, in Ephesians chapter 4, we have our text this morning of Paul giving the church not encouragement, but commands to be unified. And in verse 1, we find this. Paul writes, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which you were called, with humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. Verse 2 and 3 and 4, <clears throat> it says in verse 3, being diligent, look at this, being diligent to preserve, preserve the unity of the Spirit in what? The bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, 
Just as you were called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And so here we have this very powerful passage of what it means to attain unity. But notice, before we can even get to unity, there's a type of attitude and mindset that we should have. It's like this. Have you ever registered for something online to buy? You know, you go to Amazon, you go to eBay, and you find this item that you want, and so you put it in your car, and you go to check out, and what happens? You've got to create a registration. And so you go online, and you enter your information in, you put your name, and your password, and your email address, and everything under the sun in order to buy this item, and so you go to check out, and then what happens? You've got to confirm your email address. So then you go to your inbox and you click the link and it takes you to the website and you go to check out and now you have to log in. And so you log in, you finally get everything in there, you enter your credit card information, you put the security code on the back, you check out, voila, you have finally bought the product. There are a series of things that you have to do, that I have to do, that we as a church have to do in order to attain unity. There are steps, in other words, that we have to take. And so the first step that we find in this scripture this morning is that in order to attain unity, we must first have an attitude of humility. Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about this. The first sermon that we talked about was leadership and what an elder or a pastor or a shepherd should be, and Toby's going to be set apart as that today, and we're really excited about that. But then the second week, in order to have a strong church, we have to be humble. We have to have humility. Humility means to have a lowliness of mind that you consider yourself lower than other people, that you're not puffed up, that you are better or you are higher or you are more, but that other people are literally more important than yourself. And in Paul's day, much like our own, this was a virtue uh, that was not really recognized as a virtue. And so you got the Christian church that comes along And somebody like the Apostle Paul, who was raised in a society of enslavement, of I am higher than you, I am better than you, I am a Lord over you. And so Paul comes along, and he writes the New Testament about humility, and you can just imagine the confrontation that would have taken place in the mind of a Christian that says, I've got to be a a servant? I've got to be a slave? That's what this idea would have come through as. It is literally to be humble as a bondservant that enslaves to another person. And so think of that for a moment. Think of yourself as a boss at your job. Think of yourself as a politician. Think of yourself as a ruler. And you look at somebody that is so much farther below you, and you have to have the attitude of a humble servant. I am enslaved to you, and I consider you before I consider myself. Think about marriages. Husbands and wives are humble with each other. It's not about me and my wants. It's about them and their wants. And so when it comes to the attitude of a church, if every single person in the body of Christ does not have an attitude of humility, it is a barrier for unity. Every single person. And so we can't have 80% humble servants. It has to be 100%. And so we discussed that a few weeks ago. And James chapter 4 verse 6 says this, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so if you can think of it like this, if we are a church that wants to move forward and we want to be unified and built strong, but we have a bunch of people who are proud and arrogant and selfish, we are literally opposing God. God will not be in the work of this church. That's how important humility is. And so if we want God to reign in this church, we have to have the attitude, I may be wrong. That's what humility is. I may be wrong. I could be wrong. Number two, in order to attain unity, we've got to secondly filter our actions and our attitudes through gentleness. I think of gentleness like this. We used to play these games in in, in youth group or in high school, and you would carry an egg and a spoon, and it would be a relay race. And so you'd be trying to go as fast as you could, but what was more important? Keeping the egg intact, right? I mean, what's the point of racing forward and winning the game, so to speak, if you break the eggs in the process? And that's what gentleness is. That if we are going to move forward as a church and be strong, if you are going to move forward as a Christian and be a strong Christian, It doesn't help to win the race and break the spirits of the people around you. 
It doesn't help to build a strong church and having people feel dejected and sad and misplaced, to feel crushed, spiritually speaking. And so as we move forward as a church, if we want to become a strong church, we have to be gentle. And a few weeks ago, the first sermon that we talked about in this message, that's one of the qualifications of an elder. An elder has to be gentle. He cannot be a tyrant who crushes people's spirits just in the sake of getting the truth across or letting his opinion be known. And so gentleness is is a key aspect of Christianity. And if you think of it like this, gentleness is not weakness. In other passages of Scripture, you'll find this word being translated as meekness. It means to have a controlled power. It's like a strong horse or a stallion that literally could, could run and, and charge and flip you off. It has all of this muscle, but it's a, a horse that's under control, that, that can trot along as it's directed by its master. And so if you think of it along those lines, every single person in this room has power. Let me give you an example. I was talking with a guy that was recently introduced to our family, and he's a Christian, and he likes to share the word of the Lord often. And the thing is, is that he has, he doesn't have a really deep understanding of the word of God. And so he believes in what is called a a rapture theology or premillennialism. And so if you watch movies like Left Behind or things like that, that's that's often the portrayal of, of where he's coming from. And so we're sitting down and we're talking about the Bible, and he says, Rick, Wouldn't it be awesome to buy plane tickets when Jesus comes back and go over to Israel with the Euphrates River and the Tigris River and see the Armageddon and see Jesus come and slay all of his enemies? And he's so animated and he's so excited about what he's talking about. And the whole time in my mind I'm thinking, this is is false. This is wrong. This isn't what the Bible teaches. Jesus isn't going to come back and just start slaying people left and right, and there's going to be blood and guts everywhere, and there's going to be blood. The Revelation says blood up to your waist. That's, that's, that's not what the Bible teaches. And so I'm listening to him, and I'm thinking in my mind, man, I really like to, to say what the truth is. And so I could use my strength, my doctrinal power, what I, what I believe to be true and what the Bible teaches, and I could just totally obliterate his doctrine right now, what he's teaching. But in the process, I'd come across as arrogant and proud and a know-it-all. I mean, I've only got a small window in order to build this relationship with him. And so what's more important, making sure he leaves the room knowing that I'm right and he's wrong, or building a relationship, and maybe once that relationship is strong enough, I can share the truth with him. When that moment, I didn't really know what to say, and so I said, well, if that's how it happened, sure, yeah, that would be great. So I was able to not crush him and be gentle and handle that conversation, right? But at the same time, I, was, I have integrity because I'm not saying that's absolutely the truth. And so hopefully, and that's just one example, okay? We have a lot of examples like that. Some of you are big and strong and masculine and good-looking like myself, and so you can actually, why are you laughing? That's not a joke. And so if you think of it like this, right, if you are a strong person, you, you can hurt people around you. Even though you don't mean to be rough, even though you don't mean to, to hurt, you can damage the people around you. So we're not just talking about Christianity. We're talking about all forms of life. We have to be gentle with each other. Kenneth Bowles writes this in his college press commentary, the weak person yields because he is helpless to do anything. The meek person yields superior strength because he seeks the well-being of others. And so we need to seek the well-being of others. We need to think of others more highly than ourselves. But there's another aspect that we have to reach before we can even attain unity, and that's this. If you'll notice in the scripture that we read, it says, Be patient, showing tolerance for one another in love. And Paul clarifies the type of gentleness that the church should have, and that is with patience. The idea here is this, is to wait sufficient time before expressing anger. In other words, you want to figure out the facts. You want to ask rather than accuse. You want to gather the information before you allow your anger to be revealed in a controlled manner. And I think about this as as a parent, right? Your child may do something that's wrong, and your first instinct may be lash out. But maybe you need to ask questions. Why are they doing this thing? Why are they acting out in this way? 
Is there something that I've done to trigger them? And that's often true in marriage, right? I mean, husbands and wives, sometimes you can just be so upset. And if you could just take a step back and say, honey, did I do something that caused you to feel unloved? Or, or wives, wow, I really feel unloved in this moment. You're really offending me. Have I done something that's caused you to feel disrespected? And so if we can get clarity and understanding before we become uh, angry or we express that anger in a controlled way, that's what the Bible teaches us. And you know, I can't think of a better example than patience with Piper. She is a little growing girl. She likes to throw temper tantrums. She'll throw herself down on the floor. She'll run over to the couch and she'll bang her head against the couch. And I'm like, I think my child's actually insane or something. And, and so she'll want all of these things, and I'll say, no, you can't have that. And she'll just take off running. How crazy and inconsiderate and lacking love and patience would I be if I just flipped the switch and I just got up and I spanked her? She can't even tell me what's wrong. She doesn't even yet fully understand what's wrong. And so that's why we need clarity. You know, one of the things that she does uh, that I we're trying to teach her on is when I show affection to Angel, I'll walk up, Angel's my wife, I'll walk up and I'll give her a hug and I'll, and I'll love on her and Piper will look at us like this. And then all of a sudden she'll run up, "Mm," like that, slap me away. And I say, no, I love mommy and we are husband and wife. You know, I try to teach her like, this is a good thing. And so I'll intentionally go up to Angel and I'll put my hat on her and be like, oh, I love mommy. And she'll look at me like this and then she'll run up again and she'll no, no, is what she'll do or something of that nature. It is hilarious and I try not to laugh because she shouldn't do that. You know what I mean? But we want to teach her and be patient with her, not crush her spirit, not discipline her swiftly. And so that's the idea, being patient. Showing tolerance with patience. And so if we are going to attain unity, we have to think of it like this. The same divine quality that allows God to be patient with sinners like us is the same quality that we should show towards other people. We are going to make mistakes. You are not perfect. People mess up because we are sinners Even somebody like me, and you might think that I'm perfect. Hopefully you don't. If you talk to Angel any amount of time, you'll soon realize that. If you spend an hour with me, you will soon realize that. We have to be patient with each other. We're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. And that's what Paul is instructing us to do. And so when trouble comes our way, don't quit. Don't quit in a a rage of anger. Don't give up. Don't lash out. Don't have an outburst. Gather the facts, get the information, control yourself, be patient, and show love. And you know, it's, it's like this. You have a short fuse. You guys know what that means, right? It's somebody that goes from zero to 100 in an instant. Yelling, screaming, insulting, condemning. How do you lengthen that fuse? I mean, think about it. How do you lengthen that fuse so that you don't respond in anger so quickly? Well, here's the greatest thing that you can do. Remind yourself of the patience that God has for you. And remind yourself often, God has been patient with me. God has not given me the things that I deserve. He has shown mercy to me. And if I want God to do that to me, I should be willing to do that to other people. And as you can see, these are the types of attitudes that helps us become a unified church if we act in this way. And so he says, be patient. But show your patience with a tolerance of love. And here's what that means, right? And a lot of us don't like it. It means to put up with. And we say things like this. I am just not putting up with that, right? I am not putting up with that behavior. Oh, no. You've got to. You've got to love every awkward ounce of me. You've got to put up with my weird jokes and my cackling laugh and my insecurities and my failures. You have got to stick it out with me because you are a Christian and you're commanded to do that. Now, I'm also commanded to fix my sin. That doesn't let me off the hook. But you can't give up on me and I can't give up on you. We've got to remind each other of God's love for us. And so if I could recap before we really talk about unity, it is simply this. Humility says, I may be wrong. Gentleness says, I am willing to listen and change. Patience says, I'll give you some time to think it through. 
Bearing with says, I'll put up with you even though we disagree. And eagerness says, I really want this to work. Paul put it like this in Colossians. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as what? Just as the Lord forgave you, so you should also. Beyond all of these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And isn't that interesting? Put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Gentleness, patience, kindness, self-control are stuck in the glue of love. And if we as a church are going to be unified and built strong, we've got to have ourselves knee-deep in the glue of love, stuck in it. Everything that we do is done in love. And so it's only by this constant lifestyle can we as a church become unified. And so look what our text goes on to say here in Ephesians. In order to do what? What's the point? Preserve the unity of the Spirit. And so we've got to be of the same mind and the same foundation. We've got to think alike when it comes to what it's like to live a lifestyle in Jesus. And so here's the key phrase. Be kingdom-minded. You will never go wrong as a husband or a wife, a mother or a father, a brother or sister in the Lord, a boss or a servant, if you are thinking kingdom-minded. You can't go wrong. If everything is filtered through that lens, you cannot go wrong. You will be unified. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you but that you be made complete in the same mind and in what? The same judgment. Don't be divided against each other. Don't be disunified. Don't create schisms. Don't go off in your own direction. Don't do your own thing. We've got to think kingdomly. We've got to think corporately. We've got to do this together to preserve the unity of the Spirit. And so look what Paul lays out, a sevenfold foundational plan. If we as a church are going to be built strong, we've got to agree on seven things. Number one, he says, is what? One body. We are all in this together. <laughs> it doesn't matter where you come from, what your last name is, what the color of your skin is, what job you work, how much money you make. We are in this together because we are one. I am an extension of you, even though you may be completely different than I am. And so if you can think of it like this, you've got the universal body of Christ. You go to, as I said, Africa, Asia, China, wherever that you want to go, you will find a Christian, and you are one with them. And at the same time, we've got the local kingdom here. We've got the, the, the local body of Christ, and we are one church. We are in this together. And so while there could be many local churches, the Bible still teaches that we're all together, man. We're on the same side. And so we should not look at other churches that believe these seven things that we're going to talk about this morning and view them as competition or our enemy or somebody that we are antagonistic against or somebody that we are trying to outgrow. We have to view them as partakers of the body of Christ. Our fellowship should be together. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 5, about this one body, he says, So in Christ, though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We are one. And obviously, many of you have seen what's happened on the TV recently, and we are not going to get into a big political discussion about what certain rallies were for in Charlottesville or whatnot, but here is a crystal clear message from the Bible. Racism is and bigotry, and division about the color, or ethnicity, or background, or job description of any person is rejected and condemned in the Bible. And you can't get to heaven. You can't be viewed as a Christian by God if you are a racist. You can't, you can't do it. You can't hate other people for the color of their, of, of their skin. And the Bible says this, if you claim to love God, but hate your brother, you are a liar. And so we are one body. We are one church. Whether you're black or white, from Asia, from Africa, from South America, you speak the English language or not, we are one body in Christ. And as we move forward as a church, if we are going to be unified, we have to celebrate our differences, not reject them. And I hope that that makes sense to you. 
He also says this, not only one body, but one spirit. And this is the Holy Spirit. And if you read throughout this passage of Scripture, you will see that Paul, time and time again, says the Holy Spirit is our promise. He is the guarantor of our salvation. And he even climatically says, and you can read this in chapter 2 of Ephesians, the Holy Spirit is the one who broke down the dividing wall between the Jew and the Gentile, between the Jew and the non-Jew. And so the Holy Spirit breaks walls down. He doesn't build walls up. And so we as a church, if we are going to be built on the doctrine of the Spirit, the doctrine of the one body, we have got to work on tearing walls down in the church, not building them up. He goes on to say, one hope of your calling. Notice there's one. One body. One hope. One spirit. Now what is that one hope? I mean, if we're going to be unified, what kind of one hope do we have to have? To be a megachurch? To have a lot of services? To have a cool gymnasium? For every person to know where Seven Christian Church is? Is our one hope having a good website platform or making sure that we all look good on Sunday morning? Is, what is the one hope? And it's simply this. We hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One hope. We've got to all agree. Jesus rose bodily from the grave. He ascended to the Father, and he will come again. That is the hope that we are built upon. And so Jesus is our hope, and we've got to agree on that in order to be unified as a church. You see, when life gets chaotic, where else are you going to turn? I mean, think about it. Think about the worst moment in your life as a Christian. When your world was crashing down around you, who did you turn to? Did you not turn to the hope of the Lord, when your marriage was broken, when you lost your job, when your children uh, have went astray, have you not turned to the Lord, the hope of your life? And so Jesus, when he was in his life ministry, he had disciples that would come after him, and they began to leave because it was tough being a follower of Jesus. And finally, Jesus, exasperated, sits down, and he, and he shares this with his disciples. He says, will you too leave me? And Peter says this, where shall we go? You have the words of life. Where else are we going to turn as a church if it's not the hope of Jesus Christ? And so we have to be unified as one body, one spirit, one hope in our calling. And then look else, the next thing. One Lord. Who is the leader of your life? Who controls what you do and what you don't do? Who has the final say? You see, Peter, in Acts chapter 2, they had just crucified Jesus about 53 days, 50, 53 days earlier of Acts chapter 2. It's called the day of Pentecost. And Peter gets up, and he's on this rooftop, and there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Jews in that area at that time. And the Holy Spirit comes down from heaven, and it, it says it looks like tongues of fire. Not that it's literally fire. It looks like tongues of fire. And they begin to speak in languages that they've never studied before. And Peter stands up, and somebody calls out to Peter, Men and brethren, what is this? And Peter delivers this dynamite message. It's a national indictment against the nation of Israel. And he climatically says in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, This Jesus, whom you have crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. Christ means anointed one. It means Messiah. It's the, it's the kingship of Jesus. And Jesus just isn't our anointed king who saves. He is our Lord who reigns. And so we are united on the single lordship of Jesus Christ. And there is no one beside Jesus. Not Allah, not Buddha, not anyone, and not anything. It is Jesus and him alone. And so as a church, we have to be unified that Jesus is the Christ. He goes on to say one faith. This is the true faith that we, f- that we find in the scriptures. Jude put it like this, the faith once delivered to the saints. Now, what kind of tense is that? Is that present tense? Is that future tense? Or is that past tense? It's as if Jude is looking back in history, even writing his, his epistle, and he's saying the faith was once given. It was once delivered. It means we have it. And so you get people that come along and they have a different doctrine or a different teaching or a different ideology that deviates from the word of God, that is false. 
We cannot be a unified church if we don't agree on the lordship and the faith of Jesus Christ. And so that's why as a church, we stand on the Bible and the Bible alone. The word of God is our guide. And if we have questions about what we're going to do as a church or how we should live our lifestyle as a Christian, we go to the New Testament. And so if we are going to be a unified church, we have to agree together on that statement. He goes on to say this, one baptism. Now this is a hot uh, button issue, right? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. If you read in the Bible, you'll find this word baptizo in the Greek. It means to immerse, submerge, or plunge. And there are five baptisms in the New Testament. There are five. But yet, in Ephesians chapter 4, around 60 AD, Paul says there's one baptism. So that means that the other four are no more. You've got John's baptism in water for repentance. John the Baptist was coming along and he was saying, hey Jews, get back into a relationship with God. Because the Old Testament is a tutor, it's a teacher. It's a guide to lead you to Jesus. And so he baptized Jesus and he baptized many disciples. That's John's baptism. Then you've got the baptism of fire. That is eternal hell, which anyone who is not a Christian will undergo, that total immersion of fire. You've got the baptism of pain and suffering. This is what Jesus went through and the disciples went through on the cross. Their entire lives were saturated with pain from Jesus' crucifixion. His whole body was totally immersed in pain. Then you've got Holy Spirit baptism. It only occurs two times in Scripture, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes upon a person without the laying on of any hands, and they began to speak in tongues or have some type of sign. And this is God's validation. These people matter to me. It happened twice, Acts chapter 2 to the Jews and Acts chapter 10 to the Gentiles, Cornelius' household. And then we've got what we all practice what we read about in the majority of the New Testament. Why we have a baptistry of water here in the back, you've got water immersion. But if there's only one, and you believe that both are in existence today, you've got an issue. That's a problem. You've got to choose. What one baptism are you going to partake of? The Holy Spirit baptism, which you may be misguided upon, or water immersion, which is commanded by the disciples, by the Lordship of Jesus Christ, throughout the New Testament. And so the one baptism that he's actually talking about here isn't the momentary, occasional baptism of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and on the Gentiles. It's water immersion. It's where we tell God, God, I am a sinner, and I need you. I need to be saved. It's the same baptism that Peter preached about. I shared with you Acts chapter 2, verse 36. This Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. And you know what they asked? They said, okay, men and brethren, What are we going to do? In verse 37, they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? We are guilty of crucifying Jesus. You know what Jesus' response, or Peter's response was? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And water baptism is all throughout the book of Acts. It was always believer's baptism, for instance, Now, today, you've got a lot of different baptisms that people practice. Infant baptism, the baptism of the dead, believe it or not. Uh, You've got a lot of different forms of baptism. Well, the Bible only records one, and that is total body immersion by a believing person. If you go through the book of Acts, for instance, there are always believing adults who get baptized. Never do we have any record of children or infants getting sprinkled or poured upon or immersed in water. And so as a church... If we have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, we are going to practice the only baptism that we find in the New Testament, and that is water immersion by a believer. And so if you don't know about baptism, you can fill out on your connection card. You can, you can meet with myself or Claude or one of our elders, and we will, we will teach you about what the Bible says about baptism. But a unified church is built on one baptism. And then finally, we have one God and Father. Now, here's what's cool. I mean, we all belong to the same family. One God, one Father. We have one Daddy, (laughs) so to speak. That's actually how uh, the Bible translates this. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, it says that, For you have not received the spirit of slavery 
leading to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, which we cry out, Abba, Father. We all have the same parents. And so that's what's so incredible about being a unified church is that we are all in this together. And as I mentioned earlier about the things that have gone on and uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, and we as the United States have a very rich history of, of racism, unfortunately. And it's not all too new. Racism has been around for a very long, long time. If you go over to India and exposed to the Hindu religions, you'll find that they have different caste systems. Literally, the people that are of a lower class are just unimportant. You don't belong. You're separated from us. And so the gospel was revolutionary. The gospel unites all people of all backgrounds from all different beliefs together. And this morning, we give you the opportunity to become a part of that family. We give you the opportunity to say, you know what? I am dying to myself and my individuality, and I am becoming a follower of Jesus. These are my brothers and sisters. This is my family, and I want to belong to God. But the only way that you can get access to that one spirit, to that one Father, to that one Lord, is to obey the gospel. And the Bible very clearly says, if you are willing to place your faith in Jesus, turn away from your sins, be immersed in water, you can be saved. And so I'm going to ask that you stand And I'm going to pray, and we're going to sing a song of invitation. And if you want to accept the Lordship of Christ, we're going to invite you to do that now as we sing this song. Lord, we give you thanks, Father, for loving us, for viewing us as your children. God, I thank you for a Jew named Jesus who came down 2,000 years ago to save a wretch like us, Lord. God, we thank you that he wasn't prejudiced. God, we thank you that he wasn't racist. God, we thank you so much, Lord, that he was willing to look at somebody like us and view us as worthy of loving and saving. God, I pray that we as a church will be built strong, that you will be able to remove all the barriers, Father, all the things that bring us down and divide us and unite us, not only with our attitude, but with our doctrine as well. God, I thank you for our leaders who protect the truth, who want the church to be unified on the truth of Jesus. And God, I pray that we'll be able to continue to share that truth with the people around us. Lord, I pray over this offering that as it's passed, it will be blessed and glorified to you, that Lord, you will be able to use it for your glory. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.